Hi Miranda. Hi. So we're here to talk about Sound of the Underground. This song like transformed pop music in the noughties and it obviously made Girls Aloud from a reality TV girl band into one of the greatest groups pop's witnessed. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> what I find so interesting about it is it was never meant for Girls Aloud in the first place. No, it wasn't. It was actually written, um, well, to give you a little bit of, of background, um, I've been working with Brian since 1997, Brian Higgins. Brian was thinking, right, what should we do to break a girl group? What sort of song would we need? Let's, you know, do something sort of out the box different. We were really into drum and bass at the time. I was massively into a song called Addicted to Bass that I'd heard a couple of years beforehand in Australia. It was awesome. So Brian gave me loads of backing tracks, like banging drum and bass tracks. Um, and he said, why don't you write with Naira Scarlet? And we went to my house in my basement flat in Lexham Gardens, just off High Street Chem. It's not very sound of the underground, but... Um, <laughs> and we would set up, I think in those days, it might have been like old school dictaphones. And we would write on a number of different tracks. And we would, writing just meant a sort of singing, a stream of consciousness, literally, it's sort of like singing in the shower. Anyway, Sound of the Underground, we put it on and instantly started vibing. Um, and Brian seems to think I had the chorus ready already. I can't remember if I did, but I do remember singing The Wheels on the Bus Go Round. And I was singing, The Wheels on the Bus Go Round, The Wheels on the Bus Go <laughs> Around. That song just got so much cooler. <laughs> exactly. And then luckily, I think I had Sound the Underground written down somewhere because I used to just keep a great stack of, of notebooks with lyric ideas. So luckily it changed from uh, the wheels on the bus go around very quickly. And then Nara, Nara and I wrote the verses and unusually we would often write anything up to sort of 60, 70, 80 melodies on one track when you have both of us with our dictaphones dancing around. Um, but on this one, we pretty much had those, we had the verse and the, and the pre, and then we had the chorus and that was it. And then Brian heard it and got really excited really? about it. And Colin Barlow at Polydor loved it and said, but we have got this, this show coming up called Pop Stars. And we were like, God, not another reality <laughs> TV show, hilariously, which is in 2002. And obviously we, it felt really saturated already. And they said, we'd love this as the sort of, as, as, the, as the winning single. It was a girl group and a boy group. And we think it's either going to be this or it's going to be Stay by E17, which was like, it's two, <laughs> two totally different songs. songs. We went to the, the house where the girls uh, were living. I think there were 10 of them left at that point. Went in, I mean, they were all super, super young. And I remember we played them the record and were like, and they just looked totally blankly at us because they were really into their R&B and Mariah Carey and their big ballads. And they were just like, what is this you were playing us? And so they then came down to the studio and they each recorded it. And then we did a comp of each girl. Uh, and then when it came to the final of the show, Brian was live mixing with Jeremy no Wheatley way. in, I, uh, I can't remember where it was, um, but he was deleting each girl's vocal as they were... On television? Uh, yeah, as they were wow. being thrown off the show. And then we were left with these five, five vocals, which luckily worked really well together. Um, and I think he, they had to finish it that night for the girls to sing on the show the next day. And I think if they probably had gone with something more traditional, I think at that point the boys' numbers for the votes were far, far higher, but it was because it was such a sort of shock sound. So they ended up winning the show, which was good. And it ended up going to number one. Yeah, for Christmas four weeks, one. I know. And so after writing Sound of the Underground, was there an enormous pressure there? You know, you've just created Christmas number one, one of the most unconventional Christmas number ones in years. Well, how was it about going and then making the next one? Colin Barlow, uh, who was their A&R, he just said, do your thing for Girls Aloud. We'd then six albums um, and it sort of didn't stop. It was done with great love and great sincerity and I think I was still sort of all the time writing slightly for myself. Um, so yeah, you, hopefully you can hear that in the, in the music because it was, yeah, we weren't cynically saying, right, let's, you know, bosh out another sort of, you know, track for the masses or whatever. It wasn't at all. We were really doing, we felt there was sort of quite a lot of artistry mm. um, in it. I find it really interesting that you say that the girls are expecting some kind of swooning R&B effort and you play them this amazing like funk guitar, drum and bass touch song and they're just flabbergasted because that's what that song did to pop music yeah. in the noughties. It blew the gates open and it, you know, pop changed after Sound of the Underground. I, I definitely wanted it to have a lyrical identity, which I think then was a blueprint for them going forward. We never 
or we very rarely were writing sort of straightforward um, love songs and the, the ne their next single was No Good Advice, which was, you know, um, again, kind of an unusual subject matter. Um, and we tried to stick to that as much as possible and not also not repeat ourselves. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's the same mind that brought up something kind of ooh, which is like, <laughs> It doesn't technically make any sense, but I it's think, such a good lyric. Well, I think it's the, for me, so, so melody, as long as the, the lyric is supporting the melody, for me, when I'm listening to music, it's, uh, my reaction is very physical. So it, it's, it's based on the cause, the voice, the melody, and probably the lyric secondary. Um, but yeah, something kind of, it just worked. Brian always used to say, whatever, you, when you sing the sort of the melody, when you're, when you're writing the melody, whatever sounds you're using, you should stick to those sounds. So it was, so, and it, so I just, and every time I tried to change it to make sort of real sort of poetic sense, um, it just didn't work. Yeah. But I remember playing it to the record company and they just said, you can't, that's just filthy, you can't, you can't. And I said, there's nothing filthy about it. You're the filthy ones. <laughs> <laughs>